an introduction on data visualization. Chris comes to us from uh, from the NASA Langley Research Center, uh, <coughs> where they're currently acting as a data visualization expert for the for the chief information officer for the science team. Uh, in the past, they developed and maintained dashboards for use cases such as COVID case vaccine tracking or project management, uh, 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 as well as deploying open source data visualization tools. Uh, currently, they are leading an agency-wide data visualization community of practice, which provides training and online collaboration space for, uh, for NASA employees to learn and share experiences in data visualization. So let's, uh, so let's give her the floor. Okay. And um, once she opens up her mic, everyone on Zoom will be able to hear whatever goes on on the table. So if you need to rustle papers or anything, try to do it quietly because these mics will be live once she unmutes hers. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction there. Um, as he mentioned, I am a data visualization expert. I come from the field of software engineering and web development. That's where I started. Um, I sort of kind of evolved into the data visualization form through multiple ways. Uh, talk both uh, consulting wise of data visualization and also making some real dashboards along the way. Uh, and as you mentioned, I run a data visualization community practice. We've got, I think about 200-ish members. Uh, we just get together every month or other times as well, talk about data visualization, we get training in data viz. Um, it is NASA only, unfortunately, but if there's any NASA people in here, uh, you wanna do it, let me know. I'll be happy to recruit it at all times. Um, I am, as a complete side note, it could be, charitably described as a giant pile of anxiety trapped inside a human form, uh, which does mean I talk really fast when I get at even a little bit nervous. So if I do that, feel free to wave your arms, do anything to get my attention. No problem, I'll slow down. Um, but anxiety aside, uh, my goal here is to do a shallow dive into data visualization. I cannot hope to cross everything in data visualization. It's just too big of a topic to do. Um, but I am hoping to provide at least a foundation on data viz, um, the tools that you maybe could use in data visualiz visualization, and just uh, genuinely how you can use data visualization to better communicate your story, better tell your story. So let's see if I can get these slides to work. Here we go. Uh, this is just a quick schedule of what we're going to go over. You know, we're going to have an introduction, a bit of a philosophy of what data visualization is, what good versus bad data visualization might look like. We'll talk about some building blocks and terminology that helps us analyze data visualizations and uh, actually think about our data and how we want to apply that to a visualization. Um, we'll go over, I can't of course go over every single chart type out there, but I'll do choose some big ones out there that uh, both are good to talk about and also could be useful for your various and sundry use cases. Uh, we'll talk about some tips for design, both for individual charts, but also if you're making a dashboard. Um, those might be interesting for you. And I'll use uh, some example dashboards I've made in the past to go through those design tips. Without further ado, uh, so I don't know, this is kind of the slide that's almost required. Uh, what is data visualization? Why is it? Why do we even care about this in the first place? Um, so there's a lot of definitions. You'll find very formal definitions online, various textbooks. I like to think of it and simplify it as we are representing data, we're representing our analysis, with graphics. Um, we're using this graphical medium to uh, represent data and numbers. It's obviously has the roots in mathematics and statistics. It was actually born in stats. That's where data, data, visualization, data visualization comes from. Um, but it's also got a lot of roots in art and communication. We are trying to communicate with people with our data visualizations. We're not just doing it for the sake of it. Um, we want to talk to folks about it. Um, so we have a lot of crossover in those skills as well. Um, we're using it for you know, we're either communicating it with the general public or we're communicating with our technical peers or we're just communicating with ourselves. You know, we're doing some analysis and exploring. Um, EDA is the term you'll hear a lot, exploratory data analysis. Um, so all of these are sort of different use cases, different ways you might think about how we build these things. Um, why do we bother with this in the first place? Why don't we just have a giant table of numbers or and give those to people? Or why don't we just give it to a computer to like crunch some big number and give us the big takeaway? Uh, well, first of all, the reason we don't give it to computers is because your computer probably doesn't care too much about your analysis. It's a computer. It doesn't really, <laughs> doesn't have emotions, um, unfortunately. Uh, people, I'm not going to promise that every person's going to care about your analysis, but some of them will. Um, so there's people out there that will care about your analysis. Um, so we're trying to talk to those people, not trying to talk to the computer. Um, another reason, though, is why specifically we're using visualization for this is that people in general, they're really good at finding patterns. They're really good at 
finding these two pictures and seeing the difference between these two pictures. They're really good at noticing that this is bigger than that thing. And we have a meaning, we have an intuition of what that means. Um, we didn't have to be told to do that. We're also really good at filtering out noise. Um, this presentation is a kind of a good example of that. You're probably looking, well, you're probably looking at either me, you're looking at my title, you're looking at my text in there. You're not really, probably not paying attention to the Zoom stuff at the top. <laughs> you're probably not looking at the uh, logo over there, even though it's quite lovely. You're not looking at the page number, <clears throat> though without even being told to not look at those. Computer probably would struggle with that. <clears throat> um, we can do this quickly, we can do this very rapidly, um, and we can make reasonable assumptions about this, we can extrapolate. Um, those are all things we're trying to take advantage of when we're making data, data visualizations. Um, conversely, if we're not good at, get, if someone gave us a giant table of numbers, we're not very good at reading those. That's very difficult. We're not good at doing a lot of calculations on the fly. I don't know, some of us might be able to do a lot of mental math. I can do a little bit, not too much, um, but we can't hold a candle against a computer. So kind of in summary, why do we do this? We're trying to take advantage of the human ability to look at images and parse images. So that was kind of a philosophy sort of thing. Um, I kind of like to think about data visualization as good data viz versus bad data viz. Um, not because I like to rat on other people's data visualizations. I usually actually rat on my own data visualizations. Usually that's what I do. Um, but it's it kind of is helpful to start thinking about rules. You know, why did this data visualization work? Why did that one not work? Um, it kind of helps to quickly get in that mindset without getting into the nitty gritty of things. Um, so step one, good data viz, built on correct data built on correct calculations. That that's kind of makes sense, all right? That's like pretty straightforward. Um, if the data is bad, then it doesn't matter how pretty the visualization is, the visualization is also bad. Uh, so we don't wanna be doing that. Uh, now, that's kind of sounds absolutist. In reality, it's not. Um, I don't know if anybody here has ever seen a perfect data set. I haven't. If anybody has, please tell me. I want to work with that data set. Um, but uh, there's always something issues with it. There's always some noise. There's always some missing data points. There's always some something you need to account for. Um, and does that mean we should throw it out? Well, no, not necessarily. We can still do something with it. There is a point where it's too messy, where you can't do anything with it. Um, but we can still do some analysis on it. Um, we can do some data cleaning. That's a whole field on itself. I'm not going to get into the whole field of data cleaning and single processing. Um, but with data visual in particular, not only can we show that clean signal, um, we can also show people what we did to clean it. We can communicate. Um, one thing you'll see a lot is folks will show the raw data with a bar chart, very light, but they'll show the smooth trend on top. Um, so we're communicating that, hey, here's our raw data, but we did some analysis to smooth it and make it a little bit more clear. So the goal is not to have perfect data, it's to be honest and as correct as possible with our visualizations. We also want to uh, be providing the providing answers, possibly to questions that our audience has or that we have. Um, when I say this, I'm it's it's kind of in the field of like project management, but I find it very useful to think about um, this sort of question at answer format. Uh, so an example would be somebody wants to know about the weather today. Very specific question is like, okay, what's the temperature predict temperature like today? Uh, I, if I had the data, that's very easy to show. I show you know the Perhaps the temperature is low in the morning, gets up to 80 degrees in the day, then gets cooler in the evening. Very easy to show that with a line plot. You probably possibly even thought of the line plot when I said that. Um, so just kind of a nice way to think about that question and answer sort of format when you're making a visualization. We also want to be uh, building charts in a language our audience understands. Now when I'm saying that I don't mean like English or Japanese or Spanish, although that's probably important too to match that up with your audience. Um, but what I mean by that is your chart language. What charts types are you using? You know, um, most people know how to read bar charts. They know how to read line charts. They know how to read prime charts. They've seen those before. They can intuit what they mean. Um, maybe not everybody knows how to read histograms or ROC curves, but for the right audience, they're amazing. Like obviously a lot of stats folks here love a histogram, can get a lot out of it. A lot of people in the machine learning world love an ROC curve. Viola charts. Some audience is going to be into that, but not as many people have seen Viola, so they might need some hand-holding. Big, complex network graphs, you're probably going to lose a lot of people with those. Um, so just in general, there's no like hard, fast rules here, um, but you just want to make sure that you're not spending too much time explaining your chart types before. You want to be choosing chart types that you can just show them and they can get the answer. To combine these next two points, um, you want to make sure that um, you're able to take very complex data sets and make them look simple. 
um, which is easier said than done. Um, but you want to, your audience is coming to you to tell you, to tell them uh, what's going on. And they can't, they're not going to be able to do that if you show them a giant mass of data. They want you to simplify that as much as possible. I show that graph on the right um, just because it's a really nice example of simplifying things. It's basically covering energy usage for an entire sector in Europe, which you can imagine is a crazy big data set, but they simplify it quite a lot. There's other things too. We could probably talk about that chart, but I'll leave that for now. Um, so you want to be doing that. You want to be simplifying as much as possible. You want to make it seem simpler than it is. You want to avoid making your users do math if possible, because they're probably not going to do it. Um, you also want to be bringing attention to what's important. You want to make sure that your main point is big and bold and center and right in their faces. And then the irrelevant stuff is maybe there is reference, but it's not right in their faces. Um, Gray is really, really good at this. Um, if you, I have a lot of charts where I will you know, have my main point big and blue or red or some color, um, but I'll have the other stuff in gray. So like it's there as background information. So they have as reference, but um, they're not, that's not in the way of the main point. Um, one thing you'll hear sort of bandied around in various circles is something called the 10 second rule. You'll also hear like 30 second rule, one minute rule. Um, the specific number doesn't actually matter. The idea behind it is you only have a certain point of time with your audience it's less time than you think. Um, so what you want to do with, in that small amount of time you have with them, you need to get the answer to them and then they let them get, go. They need to get in, get the answer, get back out. If there's anything, by the way, you take away from this, that's probably the big takeaway. Help your audience get in, get the answer, get back out. So that's good data visualization. What about bad? Uh, so Number one thing, kind of similar to the number one thing for good data visualization, we don't want to be misleading. We don't want to be taking answers out of context. Um, you know, be very careful about zooming or over summarizing and missing some big point um, or going too deep into something and getting too stuck on details that don't really matter. Um, this can be done maliciously and it certainly is done maliciously sometimes, but honestly, more often than not, it's by accident. Um, a lot of chart tools, you know, if you give it their data, it's going to naively come up with some data range that may or may not be valid. Um, so you want to be careful of that. On the right, I've got a chart that I made with some real data, um, mostly defaults with the tool. It's showing some temperature data from three sensors at NASA Langley Research Center. Um, just at the surface on that chart, um, it looks like the blue is really, really hotter than the rest of that. This seems a lot more, um, which is really cool, right? Or hot, rather. Um, until you look at my y-axis and you realize it's only like one degree Celsius difference, which is that interesting? It depends on the use case, right? Like if this is talking about like global warming <coughs> of like global temperatures over a year, okay, yeah, one degree is pretty important. Um, if it's some sensor that is very sensitive and needs a specific range of values to live in, yeah, one degree is important there. But if we're talking about like just day-to-day -day temperature uh, of the ground, it's like, it's interesting, but it's not like that level of interesting. I mentioned it before, so I won't go into too much detail, but you don't want your users doing too much math because they're not, they're just not going to do it. They're going to, I may be willing to like take the average of something or subtract two lines. Um, I'm not going to do both of those at the same time. I'm not going to get a ruler out. I'm not going to get a protractor. If you ask me to do a derivative, I'm going to walk out the door and I'm never going to come back. Um, it's just not going to happen. So you want to make sure you're doing all the math for your users up front. Um, you want to make sure you're not trying to put too much stuff in the one chart. Um, you can put a certain amount of things in a single chart, but if you start adding too many answers, um, it starts becoming overwhelming and it starts uh, just being really hard to see anything going on. So you want to be careful of that. Um, you also want to make sure that your charts are accessible. So a lot of us in here are Govies or we're kind of related to Govies. Um, we, there's a law out there called Section 508, or I guess it's a section of a law. Um, basically, what that's talking about is everything, every all the content that we make has to be accessible, which means all of our content has to be accessible to everybody, regardless of that they're cited, non-cited, um, have some motor deficiency, um, prone to seizures, all of that. Your content needs to be available for them as well. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of this to it. I come from the web development field. I come from this is a really big topic. Um, we can talk about data visualization too. Um, there is challenges with that since this is an inherently visual medium, um, so that can sometimes be interesting, but plenty of stuff we can do. Um, obviously, you can make captions. Um, if you've got nice titles or subtitles, which you totally should. Um, you can just have that as the alt text or the captions. Um, you can 
uh, have alternate tables for those who cannot get to the charts for whatever reasons that are a little bit curated. That's not just a big data dump. Um, you can also try and make sure that your charts are colorblind friendly. Um, so a pretty large topic in the data viz community is about this. A certain percentage of the population is what's considered colorblind. So they can see perfectly fine, but they have issues with certain colors. Um, red, green colorblind is probably the most popular or the most well-known version of this. Um, you need to make sure that your visualization is going to work for those people as well. I think the best example um, is this one down here. Oh, yeah, I've got a little pointer. Thanks. Um, where I've got these tree map. It's not real data. It's completely fake. Um, but I've got this nice green section up here and this big red section down here. And that's really cool, right? If this data meant something, I can see like, oh, hey, the green section is twice as small as the red section. That might mean something as a person with, without color blindness. If I had red green color blindness, I might see something like this where it's all brown and that's no good, right? I've just lost whatever information I was trying to give with color. So you wanna be careful with that. Um, there's lots of places that you can try this out. Uh, my favorite is actually this uh, project Susie Lou one. Let me see if I can, can I highlight that? Nope, I mess up my charts if I do that. That's okay, I brought it up to the side. It's this chart right here. Um, it's just a website you can go to and you can plug in your color palette can mess around with it, see uh, like what all different color palettes might look with various color deficiencies. You can even see it in grayscale, which is kind of cool. So like, it's like all sorts of different things. It's a really cool site. And I highly recommend finding, either using that or finding a similar site. Let's see if I can get back to my slides. Yeah. Um, but yeah, lots, lots of tools out there that can help you out with that. Um, and related to accessibility, you wanna make sure your interactivity, if you have it, if it's not just a static plot, it's gonna be properly planned. Um, so like if you've got hover charts or hover text, sorry, a lot of like say Tableau or Power BI are going to automatically make that for you. So you want to make sure that text actually makes sense. You want to make sure that your main points are not trapped in the hover text because sometimes people can't use hover text. Sometimes they don't have a mouse for whatever reason. So you want to make sure that's helping your point. It's not hindering your point. Okay, so that was a uh, good data viz versus bad data viz, um, kind of a little bit still theoretical. Um, so let's kind of get into some building blocks and terminology. Now, I am going to be given some terms out here, some definitions. Me personally, I don't think the specific definitions really matter. Um, but the ideas that they represent um, can be helpful in uh, going on in your early life, even though somebody's not going to test you on it later, unless you take a data this class, in which case, you know, someone's going to test you on it. Um, but start, start off with thinking about your data. I, I've seen this slide in a lot of presentations, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, uh, I like to think about data in the term of in terms of items, so your records, your things, or your attributes, the descriptors of the things. So I've got a sensor reading, and it's measuring temperature or location or color or what have you. Attributes they come in all specific shapes and sizes. Um, they can be qualitative, so some kind of category, um, like color or species or something like that. They can be quantitative, so numerical. Um, and have some kind of order, excuse me. Like your date, for example, it's a very order thing. You wouldn't have uh, December 5th after December or before December 2nd, that wouldn't make any sense. Um, they, so they might be sequential, they might be diverging. But what I mean by that is there's some like meaningful midpoint. Uh, temperature is probably the best example of that. We're like freezing point, that's the meaningful midpoint and distance from freezing that way versus that way is a meaningful information. Um, or it might be cyclic, so it's going in a circle like degrees on a anything that has degrees. Sorry, I can't think of an example right now that has degrees. Um, but yeah, you, you might visualize those all in very different ways. So the other big question is what the form of your data is. Is it tabular? So is it just a bunch of records that can be put in like an Excel spreadsheet? Um, and there's maybe some order to it, or maybe there's a order to, order to it, uh, but it's nothing too crazy. Uh, is it a network? Is there some kind of relationship between things? Is there maybe an attribute that's describing its relationship to another record? Um, a good example for that is like a social media graph uh, where you have yourself, you've got a list of your friends, they've got a list of friends, such and such forth. Um, hierarchy is another closely related to network. So think of like a folder structure or something like that. Um, I have an example in there, the location uh, where, you know, you kind of have the smallest le level, you've got city, then you've got county up there, then you've got state. So that sort of rolled up, showing that rolled up might be meaningful. Um, and then there's also the status. This is mostly for like dashboarding. 
Um, but is your data set only going to be this one Excel spreadsheet forevermore, never change? Or is it going to be dynamic? Are you constantly getting in new data at, at certain points? Uh, let's see how that looked up. Okay, you can kind of see that. So that's talking about the data going into the visualization world. Um, how do we translate that? Well, thankfully, there's terms that relate directly to item and attribute. That's marks and channels. So your mark, that's a representation of an item. That's the dot on the scatter point. That's the line in the line chart, um, the area of the pie chart, something like that. Um, channel, that's a representation of the attribute value. So location on XY for a scatter plot, the size of the dot, color of the dot, um, the slope of the line, if you're using the line chart. You can use many different channels. There's lots of different channels to choose from. To the right is sort of a giant list of channels. Um, but you don't want to go too crazy. You don't want to have too many um, channels in there. So for example, with a scatter plot, obviously you have XY position is your big one. That's points position on a common scale. Um, and that one works great. That's very high up. That's really easy for people to read. Um, you can add things like color hue for possibly a label or a categorical uh, attribute. Um, you can also maybe add size to the, to the dots um, if you have some other quantitative attribute you want to do. Um, but it gets kind of tricky if you add size because you might clobber the points that you didn't mean to hide with size. So you want to be careful about adding extra channels to things if you can, if that's part of the use case. Um, not all channels are equal to others. What I mean by that is uh, the, the way this is sorted is most to least effective, most effective being at the top, least effective being on the bottom. Um, and different channels are better than others. There's been a lot of research about which ones we as humans can actually understand better. Um, so like position on X, Y, um, or any kind of scales, length, we're really good at those ones. So think about your scatters, think about your bar charts. We're really great at telling the difference of those. We can very accurately read those. Um, angle, we're okay at those. Um, you know, we can tell something is at one of the big markers, like 180, well, this is 180. This is 90 degrees, 45 degrees. We're really good at that. We can tell if something is off from that, although we might not be able to tell you the exact angle. Um, pretty decent at area, decent at depth, although that one can get tricky. So that very easily cloppers with like 2D um, positions, um, especially when you're sort of trapped in the 2D medium that most of our visualizations are. So that one's usually good to take, use with care. Color, oh gosh, color. <laughs> so the other people, uh, I'm gonna go off script a little bit, but uh, other Langley people have sort of heard me talk about the color when I try to figure out how to describe it, because um, there's a lot to talk about with color. So just with the facts, you can use differing color hues, obviously you show different categories. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, as long as you don't have too many hues and you're keeping within uh, stuff that's 508 compliant, no problems there. Um, you can also do things like uh, ascending or descending luminance, so brighter or darker colors to show di uh, greater or increasing values. Um, you can also do this with saturation as well. Um, if you're feeling fancy, you can do like a diverging color map. So you start off with blue as your low points. Um, you start off with red maybe as your high points and there's like gray in the middle to show the midpoint. Um, you don't have to use those specific colors. Those just the colors that I tend to use for diverging. Um, that can be very nice to use for diverging attributes. Um, it's best usually to, if you're gonna do this, to segment your values. So not just have like a continuous color map uh, try and like bin everything up into like specific categories, just because it's it's easier for us as humans to read bins versus try and get in the nitty gritty of continuous. Um, but yeah, just in general, I, it'd be good to be careful with color, um, be deliberate about it. Um, color is kind of the easiest thing to get wrong um, for many reasons. And if you get it wrong, it can lead to wildly different takeaways. Um, and we, or actually you saw the presentation that you told me about it. Um, there was a study about uh, some medical folks that they were given the same exact data um, with two different color maps and they found different things in one of the color maps versus the other one. So like completely different diagnosis based on the color. Um, so you wanna make sure that doesn't happen that you're choosing the correct one. Um, again, this is where I kind of go off script a little bit. Do you ever like, um, turn in your presentation and then the day before the presentation, find the perfect thing, that would have been great. Yeah, this totally didn't happen. Anyways, let me show you some things that are off the charts. Um, this is not color, obviously. This is a line chart. Probably if you can see it, let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. If I zoom in, you can probably see pretty quickly what's wrong with this. 
this is just a line with the slope one, nothing fancy about it, but you can pretty easily see that, uh, you know, my x-axis is all wonky. It's, it has a lot of spacing between these numbers, or it's really bunched up over here. And same with the y-axis, makes the, that nice, clean, uh, straight line, which should have been a straight line, look all wonky and wiggly like that. To use a very technical term, wonky and wiggly. Um, that's very obvious why that does not work. That happens a lot with color. I think this is the best way to ever describe it. And the person, uh, Josh Stevens over there, uh, this is the credit for them. So I'm very thankful for him. But anyways, um, that happens a lot with color maps. So this is the rainbow color map that probably a lot of you have seen. I'm actually very proud of this DataWorks thing. I've only seen now two rainbow color maps, <laughs> including this one that I'm gonna, and one that's gonna show later. Um, so good, on, good job, everybody. You're doing good. Uh, but the rainbow color map is very notorious for basically doing that, but with color. Um, you can kind of see if, with these lines why. Like my reds uh, do this part. Uh, for some reason, I've only got a little bit of yellow. But me as a human, I think I would think that there's enough space in yellow, the same amount of space with reds. There's this little tiny thing with orange. You can't even see it. Green's really big. Blue is really big. Purple is really big. So like all my cool colors, which has some meaning to me, seems like it's taking up a lot more space on my color map than red, which is obviously kind of problematic if we're trying to be accurate with our data. So anyway, sorry, a little bit off script because I had to hurriedly put that together because I thought it was the coolest thing since sliced bread. Um, if you want to look at this, by the way, this is from Matplotlib. Um, to give credit where credit's due, they tell you to not do this, um, but that's also just a good place for, oh, I gave the wrong URL there. Ah. This is what happens when you try and do links right before a presentation. Any hey, users? Um, but yeah, that's color. Um, I'll stop talking about it because it'll take up my entire presentation if I keep talking about color. But uh, it's good to use, but good to use with care. All right, so data simplification methods. So this is a little more simpler to talk about. Um, but usually, unless you've got the simplest data set out there, you're probably doing some kind of analysis to crunch it down a little bit. Um, various and sundry ways you can do that to do math for your users. Um, the, Easiest one is aggregation. So you've got a lot of marks and you're simplifying them down. Um, you know, you're taking the average, adding them together, binning them, some kind of aggregation where you're reducing the number of marks. You could, of course, filter uh, either uninteresting data. You know, maybe you only care about one year of data. You don't care about all 24 years in your data set. No reason to show all 24 years, just show the one year. Um, or you've got attributes that you don't care. Um, you know, going back with their record ID, I probably want to show my record ID. That's probably not telling anybody anything. Um, you can also embed stuff. So you've maybe got some interesting features of your data or some interesting attribute or summary that's interesting and adds to your story, but uh, you don't want to fit another channel in there. There's no reason why you can't add some annotations to it, add that extra information to your chart. Um, and simplification is great. Uh, there's no real rule of thumb on how much you should do. Um, you just want to be sure you're not doing too much. You might miss out on some interesting features. Um, so over there is, I'm sorry, I've never actually heard that loud said, but in Scambi's quartet, hopefully that's correct, um, where all the data sets have some similar summary stats. They've got the same mean, same standard deviation, same uh, uh, linear regression if you plot it, but you can pretty quickly see that all the data is wildly differently looking. Um, but you wouldn't have noticed that if you just arbitrarily taken the mean. So you want to be careful of that. So that was some terminology we talked about. Um, let's get into some chart types. Let's actually like apply some of the stuff to some various different chart types. So first up, I've already talked about this a lot already in examples, but scatter plot's kind of the basic one that's simple bread and butter. Um, you can use it both for presentations or for your own EDA. That's probably what it's used for the most. Um, in it, your mark is the dot, X, Y position is the attributes that you're encoding, or the channels that you're using to encode the attributes specifically to quantitative ones where your points, they might have some order, but the order of them isn't really important right now. Um, you can also add a size channel for another quantitative or a color channel for some qualitative, like a label or something like that. If you've got a lot of dots on there, um, you might consider adding a border on the dots um, to make it a little bit clearer which, where the dots end or an alpha, um, which will let you see any dots that might've been covered up by other dots. And that also just kind of looks nice. Um, like I said, they're very, you can use them for final presentations. You can make them look pretty slick, but they really shine for EDA purposes. Um, you know, you can either have just one scatter plot, you can have a lot of them. You can even make some fancy scatter plot where you can like choose your X and Y. That's the example down there. 
uh, there, we have some controls for that. Um, you can also do something called a scatter plot matrix or a spin for short. Seems kind of crazy, but really it's pretty simple. It's just you have a bunch of scatter plots if you want that are uh, that are comparing all of the different attributes. Um, if you want to find the plot of choice, you just find uh, your attribute on this axis, find it on that axis, find the intersection, and that's your scatter plot. Um, not for final presentations in any way, shape, or form. Probably shouldn't show this as like the final, but it is good for your own exploratory data analysis to get the idea of what your data looks like. Um, so, you know, I can accidentally go forward in the slides. Um, I can see that this one right here, it's got some nice sort of linear relationships. So that's kind of cool. I can see that this has some, again, to use a technical term, some sort of wavy relationship. Um, I can see that maybe some over the, these over here don't really seem to have as much of a relationship going on. So I'm able to kind of quickly just look at all my stuff all at once. Um, and as a side note, my plotting tool, this isn't required for scatter plot matrix, um, but pandas, my plotting tool, um, printed out these histograms in the middle where um, it would otherwise be comparing itself to itself, which would just be a line, which isn't very interesting. Um, so instead they put this histogram, which I think is kind of cool. So that was scatter plots. Um, the next step up is the line chart. Um, so that's your marks or your dot and your line. Very similar to scatter plots. The only difference is that by adding this line, we um, we are saying that there's some order to these marks. Um, temporal data is probably the easiest one for this, time-based data. Um, you can use line charts for other stuff too, but I see uh, time-based stuff used quite a lot for line charts. Um, we have one quantitative attribute. We're showing it across another ordered attribute. If you've got multiple trends, um, you can, of course, show multiple lines. That does get tricky. Um, since you've got too many lines, um, it can be kind of hard to tell the difference between them to see where one ends and the other one begins. Um, there's a couple things you can do for that. Um, so you've got maybe five or six of them and you've only got one of them that's really important. This is where something like the highlighting method works um, where you know, you've know you got that one that's highlighted, it's big, it's bold, it's telling all the story and then you've got the rest of them in gray and nice. Um, that's my example over here, right here. This is based on completely fake data. Um, it's about uh, all the various different space agencies and how much donuts they're launching year by year. It's a very serious thing. Hopefully everybody here um, works on it very hard. But um, in there, my big story is that NASA has been adding two new donut launches every single year, and they eventually surpassed the other agencies. So that's pretty cool. That's awesome. That's my story. Um, how do I tell that story? Well, I highlight the NASA line, give it a label, make it big and blue, um, and the rest of them, I make them gray. I don't even bother giving them a label, which you could argue I should have, um, but I don't in this case. <laughs> and that's able to tell that story pretty quickly. Um, if you have any doubt, by the way, that's my story. You can look at my title and my subtitle, and I tell you that's my story. Um, so that's kind of nice to do. Um, it's very nice when I'm working with just one uh, trend that I care about. What about multiple trends? Which, what if my task really does need to look at all the trends, and I, what I need to do is compare all the trends? Well, that's when something like a small multiples might come in handy. Um, so that's really just a term for I have a bunch of smaller plots together, and they're sharing some axes, so it's easy to compare them. Um, you could make the argument that a scatter, the scatter plot matrix before it was a small multiples, um, but you can use it for line charts too. Um, so here I can have each of the trends be its own line chart. Um, it's given all the attention it deserves and you can quickly easily like go back and forth and compare them all. So that's what that is down there. Same exact data as before, but as a small multiples now. Um, now my question that I'm asking, the thing that I'm trying to look at is how this uh, great donut exodus happened. This, so that's that point right here that was causing the spike. Um, I instead, I'm not interested necessarily in what's happened with NASA. I'm interested in how this event affected all of uh, my agencies. So now I can quickly see after plotting all the lines, showing that line where the Great Donut Exodus happened at 31, and I can see what's going on with all of those. Um, obviously, there's that giant spike for NASA. Um, these guys right here had a nice spike going on there. Uh, China the Space Agency, they had a little bit of a spike, but it's kind of maybe just noise, maybe not a big deal. And European Space Agency didn't have any spike. They didn't really care about donuts. So nice, nice stuff you can do. There's lots of cool stuff you can do with line charts. There, I love a line chart because they're both good for um, exploratory data analysis and also for uh, presenting both to general public and to a technical audience. Um, they're just a really cool, versatile tool for that. Um, and you can also combine them with other charts very easily. So like if you have a bar chart showing your raw data, you can use a line chart to show your smoothed out data if you so chose. 
Speaking of bar charts, here's bar charts. They're my favorite. I love bar charts. I use them as much as I possibly can. I just like them. They're very clear, very easy to use, um, very easy to read. Um, your mark, that's your bar. The channel it's using is a length, uh, the length of the bar to show a quantitative and the position to show the category. Um, by the way, position is used for category. You don't need to use color for category. You can use color for other things. Um, if you want, you can, if you've got sort of subcategories in the bar charts, you can group them up together. So called a group bar chart. Um, that's that example down at the bottom where you've got uh, subcategories by year. It's kind of weird to use years as subcategories, but that's okay. Uh, you can do that. Um, you can also uh, use something called a stacked bar to show parts of a whole, if that's important. I don't have an example in here, I apologize. Um, if you've got a lot of labels if, uh, or a lot of little tiny labels or a lot of big labels, you can try a horizontal label or a horizontal layout, I'm sorry, versus a vertical layout. That way you have enough room to show all your labels and you don't have to sort of scrunch them all together or show them at a 45 degree angle since that reduces readability. Um, you can sort things by bar height for easier comparison. Um, that way you're not sort of like this, this chart at the top right is probably a lot easier to read than the bottom left because I'm actually sorting my bar heights. You can see quickly which ones are hot, bigger than the others. Um, and you can also, uh, you know, keep color specifically for highlights um, for coloring those groups and stacked bars. Gray, always a style. Um, black and white's always great. Oh, histograms and box plots. So probably a lot of people are familiar with histograms in this room, uh, but I'll go over them anyway together since they're dealing with this very similar things. They're both showing distributions. Um, your histogram is uh, also has a bar as a mark. It represents a bit of data. Um, and what you'll do is you'll take all your data, you'll subset it into these bins, you'll sort it into these bins. Each bin has a range um, and you'll plot that. And the length of the bin is the number of values you put in those bins. And position on x-axis, that's the value of the bin up there. It's a little bit Bit of an estimate since it's a range. Um, if you care about the specific point of it, you can probably look at your charting tool. Um, it'll tell you what midpoint is it. Is it using midpoint? Is it using the max? Whatever, and you can customize that if you need to. Um, they're really great for looking at distribution. They're they're very invaluable for like a stats audience. Um, you probably don't want to show them to like a general audience. General audience might be a little bit um, confused by them, um, but for technical audience, they're really great. Um, if you want to show like two or three distributions at once, you totally can. That's totally cool. Um, what you would do is you put them on the same axis, give each distribution a different color. Maybe also give them an alpha so you can see like the intersection between them and which ones are overcoming the others. Um, that's kind of what I have shown down here. We can see this nice alpha going on so you can see what's underneath the distribution. Um, you can adjust the bin size as needed. The specific bin size to choose is no real hard, fast rule. I've found like equations out there that you could look at if you so chose. Um, really, <clears throat> the Goldilocks principle, you don't want your bin size to be too big because that's going to hide any important details. You don't want things to be too small because the noise is going to take over. If you've got, um, oh, I'll mention that still later. Um, that's the thing about histograms. For box plots or box and whiskers, it's the same exact thing. Um, we're also showing a distribution, but now we're showing it a little more compact. We're showing it as a summary. Um, we've got the box, which is our interquantile range, midline's medium, top and bottom, <coughs> Q1, Q3, respectively. So your, what is that, 25th and 75th percentiles. Um, your whiskers and your lines, that's showing the rest of the data. That's showing, uh, that, that is excluding outliers. Um, so most of your data is going to, almost all of your data is going to be within those boxes and then the whiskers. And then your dots are your outliers. Um, you would plot the dots wherever they have to fall on the x-axis. Um, I have... Traditionally, this is each outlier gets its own dot. I have seen charts out there where they summarize uh, dots into one specific dot. I don't know about that. I have mixed feelings with that, um, but traditionally it's one dot per outlier. Um, these are, again, they're showing distributions. Since it's a summary, you're not gonna get the details of a histogram, but the nice thing of them is they're so compact that you can compare a lot of distributions all at once. Um, so where before you're probably limited to like two or three distributions, um, for this one, you can probably do, I mean, you're going to run out of space on your computer at some point. Um, and if you've got like six distributions that you want to plot either horizontally or vertically, that's totally reasonable to do. Now, one thing that both of these run into is outliers, very large outliers. So probably if anyone's like done anything with distributions, they've had something where like they have a histogram and then there's like one value that's like 900,000 way over there and it's completely destroyed your distribution. Um, which is not ideal for many, many, many reasons. Um, mostly that it's squished up your actual distribution. You can't actually look at it. So what do you do with this? How do you deal with that? 
Well, it depends as all things. Um, if it's not real data, if it's just like an error code, like 999, just get rid of it, it doesn't matter. Um, if it's real data though, that's the really tricky thing is that's where you need to figure out what to actually do with it. Um, after some playing, I've kind of gotten into the habit of using annotations to deal with it. So I'll choose some threshold above my distribution or below my distribution, depending on where the outliers are. And I'll get rid of all those points. And then I'll add an annotation saying, hey, uh, there was 15 points that were above this threshold. The max of it was 700 or something, whatever it is. Um, and I'll have an arrow pointing the direction that I took away these outliers. Um, that I found is pretty good to do. It's showing all my data, but I'm not letting the outliers take over my data set. So tons of stuff you can do with that. Parallel coordinates. This is a kind of a cool one, although most people, folks are not as familiar with it. So um, may need a little bit of hand holding to show them. Um, the idea is your mark is your line. It's going to span a bunch of different axes. Um, each axis represents an attribute and the range for the attributes. So when it zigs past one line, that's the value for that attribute. Um, and you can put, of course, as many lines as you need to for your data set. Um, these are kind of cool. They're kind of, I, I personally think they're more in the EDA world versus the final presentation world, even though they look kind of cool. Um, it's kind of hard to describe them sometimes. Um, but they're really nice for seeing the range of values. If there's one uh, attribute that has a greater um, range than another value, that they're really good for that. Um, there's two versions of this. There's the one where all of your axes are synced, which is that one at the bottom, where all of them are going from 0 to 14. Um, so that's kind of cool, but it does have the bad side where like one value could be uh, much greater than the others are range, so it kind of squishes the rest of them. So that's not ideal. Um, or you could not sync your axes. You can just have them all be their own thing, which um, avoids that problem. But I don't know. Me personally, I think it looks kind of messy. Um, and it also might be a little bit confusing that all these axes are different. So um, they're kind of cool for the game. Um, you could probably make them look pretty slick if you wanted to. Um, I'd just be careful with them. I have a quick question. Yeah. On the previous slide, are those top and bottom graphs the same graph, just with different scales on the Y? Yep. Wow. Same, same data, same graph. Um, so yeah, the difference is that these two right here, um, and I've broken like my own principle of making font sizes big enough for people to read, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but this is 0 to 14. This is me clicking the button by accident. Um, whereas all of these are their own thing. So like ash is 1.36 to 3.2. Um, flavonoids is 0.34 to 508. So they're all their own axes. But that's a good question. Cool. So vector fields. Um, so these are actually really cool. Um, and they're cool for many reasons. One, they look cool. Um, but because they're actually very complex graphs, but they're very intuitive at the same time, which I find very fascinating. Um, your mark is your arrow. Um, so you have a bunch of different locations. Um, actually backing up a little bit, you're using vector fields often for showing like fluid dynamics or wind speeds or things like that. Um, anything that's got sort of a flow attached to it. Um, so you've got a lot of position markers um, and you are putting your each vector on each position um, the direction of the arrow that's showing you the direction of wherever the data is going, so the direction of the wind, direction of the flow, um, and then the length of the glyph, the length of, or the weight of it, that is, uh, that's the magnitude of the wind blowing or the flow going or what, whatever uh, metric you're using. Um, so they're very complex charts, especially once you start adding more and more arrows, but it's one of them where the more marks you get, it's almost more simple. Um, they're almost more readable. Um, so like this is an example um, actually from NASA where um, I guess you, this maybe is more accurate as a flow chart, not a vector field, but that's semantics. Um, but there's a lot of arrows. It's showing all of the um, ocean currents for um, around the Americas. Um, tons and tons of data, but you can vary all the it's a little bit hard to see on that one, um, but the screens over there, you can see it a little bit better where there's uh, these swirls around the American uh, East Coast. Um, you can kind of see that going through the Gulf. Um, you can see that there's like these little whirls going on over here in the Atlantic. Um, there's like this trail going on under the South America. There's this big, and sorry, this is going to make it very obvious that I know nothing about naval or oceanography, um, but there's a big old current going through the middle where I think a lot of folks use it for like shipping to go really fast across the Pacific. And sorry, I don't know much about this, um, but even me as a novice, I could pick up those details that um, might otherwise be hidden with another more traditional chart. Um, so that's kind of cool. 
Um, I will mention, I mentioned about the color map earlier. I'm going to come back to that for a second. Um, they use a rainbow color map for temperature. I won't dig into this too much because I already dug into it. Don't do that. NASA likes rainbow color maps. They're very pretty, but they're very misleading for many different reasons. Um, they might have done a corrected color, rainbow color map. I don't know. Um, I did not see their scale along with the data, um, but they're more trouble with it than they're worth usually. Um, but it, just in general, the color map aside, um, vector fields are very good for a lot of various different use cases, especially when you're using them for something like this. Okay, so I'm going to get into a big controversy. Um, yeah, if you ever want to start a fight in like Thanksgiving with like anything, just forget politics, forget like religion, just like bring up pie charts and like that'll ruin Christmas or whatever holiday you want to ruin. Um, but <laughs> we're going to try and keep to the facts as much as possible with pie charts and donuts. Um, so at its core, pie charts are, um, they're encoding uh, parts of a whole. So it's all about proportions. If you're not sure proportions, obviously maybe try something else. Um, in pie charts, um, the circle is the whole and the slices of the pie that is showing the specific parts of the proportion. Um, again, this is more proportion. So if it doesn't add to 100, <coughs> it's something else. Um, donuts, pretty much the same thing. Um, the only difference is that they've got that hole taken out of the middle, um, giving it that donut shape. Um, so if you want, you can put some summary stats in there or you can just leave it blank for layout purposes. Um, you'll get, there's some mixed feelings about pie charts versus donut charts. Um, I tried to find like some, there's a lot of hot takes on the internet. I'll back up. You can find a lot of people giving you a lot of opinions about pie charts and donut charts on the internet. Um, I tried to find some actual research about it to see which one's better. Hello. I have a question when you're done talking about these. Oh, okay. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, there's some research that I found about it, um, about which one's better than the others. Um, so I couldn't find, I found it, I think a total of three papers on the subject. Um, the ones I did find couldn't find any big difference of the accuracy between pies and donuts, um, unless as long as you didn't go like too uh, thin of a line is okay. Um, there's a little bit of disagreement about whether you're using angle for pie charts. Traditionally, it's angle, um, but a lot of research has shown that area and arc length is actually a big point, which is probably why the donut still works for a lot of folks. Um, if you want, you can obviously use color to do categories. You don't want to do too many categories because it's very hard to read categories after a while. Um, but you can do a couple. Um, using like one or two categories is actually pretty nice. Um, you can also add hover text or text labels for specific numbers if you so chose, or again, using the highlighting method. Now, should you use these? Um, this is where the controversy is. Um, again, you'll find so many hot takes on the internet. Um, most people will tell you never to use a pie chart and don't even think about a donut chart, just delete it from your brain. Um, I personally, I will use a donut chart sometimes. Um, I will sometimes use pie charts in, and that is totally fine for very specific use cases. So if I'm talking to a very specific audience, maybe an upper management or a general audience, a lot of people know what pies are, so I'll use it for that. Specifically in the case of using parts of a whole where I only have a certain amount of categories, I probably wouldn't do it in a scientific paper, but I might do it for that general audience. Um, and, and I usually use donut charts just because I think they look nicer. Um, and I couldn't find any Research telling me that they were worse. But anyway, sorry. So my question, maybe you're going to cover these, but in case you don't, uh, my least favorite is star plots, sometimes called spider graphs. Yeah. Where you have like a multiple uh, variables and you try to, are you going to talk about star plots? Or? I will not, but that is a very good point. So yeah, star graphs, for those who are aware, they are, um, they kind of almost look like spider webs. I think at the end of them where you have uh, like, actually, they're probably actually very similar to parallel coordinates. Just think of a parallel coordinate, but drill around. Um, yeah, those are very difficult for people to read for a lot of folks um, because you have to do a lot of like tilting your head to figure them mislead. out. It can mislead too, because it's the same thing you said, areas. Mm -hmm. when you reorder the axis, the areas are changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it can be very hard to read. So yeah, I've seen them, some things, I've seen some of them successful if it's like a couple categories and there's only a couple points. Those are okay, but if I had ever made them, I personally would have just done a different chart. Um, but yeah, I will not go over those, but thank you for ask, asking because those are very interesting charts. Um, actually related to that, this is a little bit off topic, but you'll sometimes see uh, pie charts where they're kind of like exploded out. Um, where like, uh, you know, this big blue one would have been super huge and then your 
it's basically adding more area to it, which um, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about that, whether that's actually more readable or not. Um, but okay, nobody, nobody threw anything at me though with the pie chart, so I did good. Um, now that we've gone through that, we've talked through different uh, chart types. We'll get into some dashboard design. That's kind of fun. Um, now I mentioned these are, this is, I'm gonna be talking more on the dashboard line. You can use some of these uh, tips and tricks for just simple charts as well. No reason why you can't. Um, but in general, when I'm designing a dashboard, um, the step one is getting my use case, getting my set of questions. Um, what are people actually interested in? If I have some stakeholders, that's great. I can just talk to them, just see what they're interested in. Um, sometimes it's just me if I'm doing analysis, but that's okay too. I can make up my own questions. Um, once I have those, once I know what people are interested in, I can find the data if I didn't already have it, because obviously sometimes you already have the data. Um, when you have that, when, when you're finding the data, you want to find as much information about that, as much metadata as you can find about it. Um, if you can get a data dictionary, that's formal. That's great. But honestly, just anything you want to, it's better to ignore data than it is to not have the data in the first place. You have that, you can start making some more specific questions. Um, like sort of way back before I was talking about the weather, the general question was, what's the weather going to be like? My specific question was, what's the predicted temperature going to be like? Um, so you can do that, start making some exploratory data analysis, further refining all that good stuff. Um, once you've got a nice set of questions and you kind of know what the data is going to look like, you can start sketching out some charts that will answer those questions. Um, I'm not going to really tell you what tool to do that for. It's kind of, these are all your own notes. You can do whatever you want. I personally like in they got an MS Paint um, or I'll make like some chart with half made data or something like that. We're not trying too hard because it's just a sketch. Um, and if I'm making a dashboard, I'll put it into PowerPoint and I'll like mess around with the squares. Um, some people like pen and paper. Some people like just going in the tool itself and messing around. It's your own sketch. You can do whatever you do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But once you have that sketch and it looks like it's going to do your job, you can maybe even like ask your stakeholders to see like, hey, is this going to work for you? Um, you can make your first draft in the tool of your choice. Again, I'm not going to get into the tool. That's a whole other conversation. We're not going to get into the data visualization tools. If you want to talk to me about that, happy to talk about that. I have opinions. Um, but start making your first draft. See what worked. See what didn't work. Um, see if you, any of your calculations were incorrect or if they need some adjustments. Um, then you can start iterating and remaking drafts, redoing your calculations and your visualizations as you need to. Maybe realizing that one chart type didn't work, you need to replace it with something else. Um, but at some point, you'll rear it to a point where you're like, I'm happy with this. It looks good. It's correct. Um, looks slick. I'm ready to give this to whoever needs to see it. So this is an example I used as a training about a year ago. Um, we made up a fake, since it was a training, we made up a fake use case where um, there was somebody that lived in Hampton Roads, and they often found themselves flying to Atlanta, Georgia to visit family and friends. Um, so they wanted to get some recommendation on airports to choose. Um, so there's three, for those who aren't, aren't aware, there's three airports in the Hampton Roads area. There is Newport News, Patrick Henry is the name of it. Uh, there's Norfolk. And then if you want to, you can drive up to Richmond. There's an airport up there too. Um, so we're trying to think of like, what would this user be interested in if they were trying to make these decisions? Uh, well, one, they might be interested in uh, the cancellation rates of airports. Is there one airport that's more likely to cancel than others? Um, they might be interested, obviously, in knowing where those airports are so they know how far they have to go to get there. Um, they might be interested in knowing the cancellation rates of specific airlines. Maybe the airport doesn't matter, but the airline does. They would want to know um, flight time. So like how long is it going to take to get from Hampton Roads to Atlanta? That's important as well. They might also be interested in departure delays, knowing which airports are more likely to have departures. And if they are depart delayed, you know, is there a chance of them catching back up again? So after doing that, going back and forth, finding my data set, I came up with this sketch. This is pretty much exactly what my sketch is. I just pretty much just copied and pasted from one PowerPoint to the other. Um, but I've got that text up there for my title to let people know what's going on. Got my uh, charts. Some of them are made in the tool itself, made in Tableau, because that happened to be what I was using. Um, I've also got some, some of those doodles in Paint that I was talking about, where I just doodled something in MS Paint to show some bar charts. So showed that to my fake customer. It was a real guy. There was a real dude that was coming up with this, but um, it, he didn't really have this use case. Um, he said it was cool, so I tried to make my first draft. And that lower right plot. Are those bars different widths on the lower right plot? They are. Um, that is mostly. That doesn't actually mean anything. <laughs> that's just yeah. It's a good catch, but yeah, that's just me not being very accurate in my MS Paint. Yeah, good catch though. Um, here's the actual uh, or the actual first draft. So not yeah. Now those bars are properly the same size. Um, 
So this is the first go for first goes. It's okay. Um, font size is maybe a little bit small. Um, I noticed that on here, my cancellation charts, there's not actually anything telling you there's cancellation. I forgot to put the title. Oops. Um, I also didn't label all the airports. So it's just kind of these random dots that are on a chart. So that's not very interesting. Um, my box plot uh, that I was trying to show the distribution with. Um, oh, hey, look, I've got some nice, uh, Nice outliers to deal with. So we'll come back to that now that we know how to deal with those. Um, I don't know if this bar chart looks all right. Maybe it could look a little bit nicer. This one's okay. Um, this one's all right, I'm showing my average departure delays by airport. Um, but the problem with it is that it doesn't actually show my four airports of interest. It doesn't show PHF, ORF, uh, Richmond, or Atlanta. So it's kind of, it's interesting, but it's not interesting to my use case. Um, and my how often do late departures catch up one, that seemed to be fine. That seemed to do its job. Um, although well, I take it back, I have some typos. Actually, as a side note, notice those typos two weeks ago. Um, so, you know, almost a year after I showed this, but anywho. This was my final draft after I did my drafting process and reiterating. Um, so I put my title back on, put those labels there, um, took, dealt with my outliers, cleaned up a couple various layout, different things, added, forced in my, uh, airports of note to the departure of the latest chart. So you can kind of see those, they're nice and highlighted. So they stand out, um, fix my typos. If I came back to this now, I'd probably change some more things. I'd probably make the font size even bigger because it's a little bit hard to see. Um, I would consider maybe these charts, um, making it more obvious that they're for all of America and not, they're not just sequestered to these four airports. It's not really obvious right now that there's that kind of difference between the two levels. Um, so a couple of things I would still change, but such as life, this was uh, good enough for the training session that I was putting together. So that is what was my final. For an actual final, um, this is something that I did for a real use case. Um, we had a project where we were migrating from an old content management system to a new one. The old one was about, I don't know, 20, 30 years old, had about three terabytes of data, 200 plus collections on it. Um, all of those collections had their own requirements, their own POCs, all of this stuff. It was really difficult to track. My uh, boss at the time uh, was trying to do it in an Excel spreadsheet, um, which was great for data entry, but like really hard to actually get any reports out. Um, so I made it this dashboard. Um, so it's got a lot of stuff. It's got that donut chart in there. Sorry. Um, it's the same donut chart as before. Um, but it's got some nice area for summary stats. It's got a big donut chart for uh, an overall of the states. I use the same color scheme across all my charts. So there's that continuity. Um, this is a little bit questionable, but I did use a diverging. Uh, color scheme to show uh, my different states. So kind of the difference between still in progress things. Um, so processing, migrating, things like that um, versus complete, which is like verifying, you know, we're pretty much done with it, but the customer needs to check to see if it's okay. Um, and then actually complete, um, have a nice stacked bar chart for uh, showing where things are going, what director it has the collections. Um, all that good stuff. So that was kind of a nice thing to put together. I wouldn't have done this. I hate that those are 45 degree angles. Ah, anyways, um, this was something after the process, doing the same process as before I came up with this chart. So that was kind of nice to put together. Ah, cool. So coming to the end. So if you want to learn more, there's lots of stuff to learn about data visualization. I pretty much learn new stuff about data viz every day. Um, and I will hopefully continue to do that because it's a lot of fun to learn about. Um, if you want to look at some government resources, there is actually some government resources out there for data viz. Um, they're fairly high level, um, but they've got some good information specifically on accessibility that I highly recommend. Um, if you want to look at different chart types, uh, data viz catalog is a pretty good place to see all the various different chart types. Um, there's more out there than the what, seven or eight that I showed. Something that's always helped me is to look at good data visualization and figure out what I liked about it, what uh, worked for me. Um, so like a lot of new newspapers have really good stuff like New York Times wins a lot of awards, rightly like so. Um, econo e uh, economist, yeah, economist, <laughs> I can't say that word properly, um, but they have a lot of good stuff. And they also have a newsletter where they talk about um, how they came up with their data visualizations, which is really nice. Um, I also look at sources of bad data visualizations, specifically thinking about how I might improve it. That is something that's a very good exercise. Um, there's a lot of sources out there that'll sort of aggregate those, make over Monday's one. Um, another one, um, and actually, could you, as the uh, moderator, could you just like close your ears for like one second? Okay. Yeah, just like one second, just kind of, I won't say anything about it. Uh, it's called uh, callingbullshit.org. Um, <laughs> it's a really good place. It's got some really good stuff in there. I've got a link um, to it somewhere. Uh, 
yeah, that right up there. Um, it does a really good deep dive into uh, less than ideal stuff and talking about specifically why they're not as great, what they might have been able to do better. Um, so lots of good stuff up there. You know, ask feedback from folks, um, specifically folks that are both going to tell you if it's good and tell you if it's bad. You don't want someone just to say, good job. You want someone to like give you constructive criticism. Um, and it's just general practice, practice, practice. Um, the stuff that I made five years ago, I use as examples for things you shouldn't do. <laughs> Um, and probably five years from now, I'll show, I'll probably show this and say, hey, don't do this. I don't know. Maybe I'll still like it. Um, but that's just the way it goes. And always more practice like there. If you want, there's some more sources of reading. And that's pretty much it for me. And thank you for your time. Do we have any questions uh, from the in-person audience or, or from the Zoom audience? Yes. Hi, I know you said you weren't going to talk about the tools that you usually use, but I was wondering if you could briefly just say like what your preferred tools are, whether that's Python and maybe what packages those are. Um, yeah, that is a good question. Um, and my answer is long and wielding and winding. Um, I don't have a specific tool that I use a lot. Um, it kind of depends on the project and what you need it to do. So if I'm doing like dashboarding, um, I'll probably like go into Tableau or Power BI just cause that's what I have. Um, I also, one of my other hats is SharePoint. Um, so I just live in the SharePoint world. So Power BI is plugs into that. Um, I've used like Python and specifically Matplotlib and Plotly a lot. Um, and those have been very nice. Um, there's a lot of good like dashboarding and web stuff in there if you need like very custom things. And the nice part about Python is it's probably plugging into whatever analysis you're already doing. So that's very convenient. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I've actually um, gotten into using Excel. Excel has like really nice plotting. Um, it, initially it looks like garbage. Like the first plot you come up with looks like garbage, but you can customize like everything. And so like, uh, let me go back. Let me actually go back. This might be kind of fun. Whee! Yeah, so the, this over here I mentioned that was pandas. Um, the this is Dash, which is Python Plotly. Um, this is Excel. This is Excel and a little bit of MS Paint to make the uh, labels go where they're supposed to. Um, so that was kind of fun. This is all Tableau, except for that one down there, which is Bokeh. Um, I didn't actually make that. That's just from their Bokeh uh, documentation. So Matplotlib, Matplotlib. I don't know what they did. It looks cool, though. Um, and that's Power BI. So yeah, I kind of use a little bit of everything. <laughs> And unfortunately, I couldn't tell you exactly, though. So. Um, but yeah, good question. Could you comment on your perspective or difference in perspective between Edward Tufte and you? Did you know Tufte? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Could you comment on your, what you think about his principles and your... Um, I've, I've never been asked to compare myself to Edward Tufte. I don't know what to do myself with that. Um, <laughs> So, so for those who know, Edward Tufte is has a lot of stuff about data visualizations. He's founded a lot of the principles of data visualization, um, and he's also very big on. Uh, I don't know if I could try, attempt to summarize all of this stuff. Is like keeping it like simple and not like letting extraneous stuff get in the way. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I agree with a lot of stuff that Tufte says. Like he's foundational to the work of data visualization for a reason, um, and I always very much enjoy his stuff about trying to keep things simple. Um, he probably wouldn't appreciate me making a PowerPoint because I think he has a specific thing about don't make PowerPoints. Um, but <laughs> he's got a lot of good information. And one of the things, uh, I don't know, I, I could say a lot of good things that he's done, but I would recommend anybody to read those up. So I don't know, I don't think that answered your question. I think that was just me being a fan about Edward Tufty. <laughs> uh, there was one uh, comment from, from the Zoom audience, uh, not, not so much a question, but whatever this person said, had a professor that liked to have a space and long bar uh, and long bar charts every five bars for better readability and and the descending or ascending order is very important. So. Yes, yeah, definitely. Like keeping it ascending and descending, it's so much easier to read that versus trying to like go back and forth between which one's bigger. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with that. Curious thing, designing for online, do you have to adapt the visualization? If it's going to be used in a publication, or are you kind of you got to go by a different set of rules? Oh, I see. Um, that's a good question. I I would say yes, ish. Um, in the sense that you want to tailor your thing to your audience. Um, maybe not necessarily different like principles, but um, 
like I'm probably like going back to the ROC curves, I think I mentioned those, those are something you see in like machine learning all the time. Um, that's probably perfectly reasonable to show in a like publication, but not something I would put in like if I was happened to have a newspaper, I probably wouldn't put an ROC curve in the newspaper. So I know there's a little bit of that. I would say a lot of the principles still stay the same. Um, like you should still, you know, having good data, making sure it's accessible, all of that stuff, that would be the same, but you would definitely want to tailor it to your audience. Any other questions? Right. Yes. Do not a trick question. Do you have any tips for presenting your visualization, like giving the soundtrack to it? Oh, uh, I don't know. I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think a good way to do it is to. I mean, I'm trying to like go back a couple of them, and I've destroyed my presentation. Uh, let's see, where am I? Yeah, those. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's part of just having it as part of the storytelling. You know, obviously I don't want to just like, I mean, not all data visualizations have this title or subtitle, but I don't want to be like getting real close and reading my titles and subtitles. Um, but I want to be using that to aid my conversation. Um, so I'm not like spinning everything on there, but that's up there. I'm maybe describing some interesting details of it, um, but it's not the entirety of my talk. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, as an aid to the storytelling process, I think. Do you have any opinions on on uh, multimedia uh, inclusion uh, in presentations? I, I think you touched on this very briefly earlier, but I mean, do you think that's a, a distraction or or that can be an enhancement for? So um, by multimedia, like what do you like like taking up two minutes of your presentation to show a video, for instance, uh, or something oh, like I see. that? I mean, um... or uh, you know, audio. You know, anything else besides just regular slides that you just looked at? So, yeah, yeah. I, I guess that probably depends on like how how tech savvy do you feel? Because um, I've definitely been in presentations where someone's tried to do that and it didn't work because they didn't know how to turn it on. Yeah. And so they just kind of had to like lose that. Um, I have seen actually very recently, uh, yeah, beginning of this week, lost track of time. Uh, we had someone who they did 3D animations that was their data visualization they had a lot of 3d modeling that they were doing and it had to be shown as a video mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's the only way they could do it and that was very effective though and they knew how to deal with that so um yeah i would say you could probably get away with a lot of stuff as long as you're as long as you the presenter are comfortable with it okay um but yeah any and then you can also describe it like you probably don't want to just like throw the video up and then like walk away like yeah. you probably want to like stay with right. it yeah. um yeah that's a good question okay any other questions Okay, uh, let's give Chris one more hand. Thank you so much.